uh, first webinar in robotics for the month of May, because this is our robotics month. And today we are going to discuss a problem that is actually quite um, important nowadays, uh, which is the multi-robot integration problem, also known as the OEM wall garden problem. So what is this problem about, uh, Julian? Oh, it's, uh, well, the, I think the analogy is quite nice, the wall garden. So basically it's the assumption that, and we will cover the many aspects of it, but that if you're building something with multiple robots and maybe you don't want to depend on a single supplier, so you would go and request multiple robots and maybe the communication stack they're using or some other aspects are really only that supplier uses that technology. And so the wall garden problem is how do you <coughs> go over, over that wall garden exactly. and manage to make them talk? And this is a problem that we see, especially if you look in warehouse, most of the time you don't have all the robots that come from the same manufacturer. Yeah. And Definitely. so if you have to do some kind of fleet management, all of a sudden it becomes quite complicated to be able to coordinate all of them together. And uh, there are product, you know, companies that do custom product to, to build that and will show that actually you know, with, with Zen and our ecosystem, that's maybe not so hard to, easy, uh, to solve. Yeah. So uh, let's, uh, let's get started, I'd say. Let me go back to my presentation. And let's start defining or identifying the kind of wall that we can have. Because roughly, as we will see, there are three different kinds of wall that might be um, uh, cage our, our robot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that require some form of integration at different level. At the lower, lowest level, we can have challenges with respect to network connectivity. Because, you know, we've seen this sometimes in uh, um, some oceanographic robotics, but maybe not all the robot might be equipped with the same kind of physical network. So some robot might have Wi-Fi, other robot you know, we have had experience with open ThreadX, for instance. And so even if everything else is the same, so the protocol, the data model, if you're not able, right, to share the same kind of network technology, it's very hard to communicate. And that's the most mm -hmm. fundamental problem that sometimes cannot be overcome because, um, or easily overcome because you can't necessarily add the new network or not always. In some cases you can add the dongle, but not always, because that uh, um, might not al always be possible. Right. So that's the first problem we need, we need to address, right? Yeah. Then if we have, or if we have robots or you know, our infrastructure that share, let's say, uh, or somehow we have overcome, and we will see how this problem can be overcome. Um, so we are able to work um, or you know, bridge across network, then the question becomes, do we talk the same protocol, mm. right? Because you might be talking uh, MQTT, I might be talking something else, and uh, another robot, maybe, you know, using latest or next generation ROS might be talking Zeno. So how do we uh, mix all of this, right? And then even if you're talking the same protocol, right? And I like to make this analogy with, with the way in which we talk, right? Because I, when I speak, I produce, essentially vibrations, right? Um, and this vibration hit your ear uh, and they can propagate because we are not in vacuum, right? Because if we're in, so that's our networking layer, we are in place, right? And then actually we are sharing a protocol and a data model right now. Yeah. Because if, se comincia a parlare italiano, mi capisci? <laughs> or si non pas son français et dans ce cas-là c'est eux qui ne nous comprennent pas yeah. so you get the point right it's not sufficient to share the network and the protocol you have to share a common data model it's right? a language basically exactly mm -hmm. and uh, you know maybe i say um aqua and in french you say oh and in english you say water it's always water right so the semantics is the same but we may use different re representation for it and that's a point we also need to overcome. <clears throat> so going a little bit more on detail, if you look at the network wall, as we dis just discussed, right, we might have two robots that might be equipped with different networks, and there is no way, you know, that we can put a Wi-Fi dongle, for instance, on the robot on the left, or a BLE dongle on the robot on the on the right, or maybe, you know, we just can't get them to, to talk on the same kind of network. So here you visualize the first problem. Again, as we were discussing before, the protocol wall 
we assume that we can share some network somehow, right? And then we might be using very different protocol. And so even, you know, if we talk English, right? Um, but again, if we don't use the same underlying protocol, right? We might say things that potentially could understand each other, but we carry those across in way that are not understandable. Sure. And then we get to the data model world, which is unless, you know, we have a, a similar or a compatible data model, we understand and we represent information the same way. You know, even if below we are using everything else, we just can't talk. And so how can Zeno help solving this problem? So let's open a small parenthesis on Zeno. We have given uh, an introduction in, of, of, of Zeno in the previous webinar, but we have to do it every time just to make sure that newcomers you know, don't feel left alone. Education is repetition. <laughs> exactly. So as some of you might know, and for those of you that are new, Zeno is a, a kind of different beast <clears throat> because it's a pub, sub, and query protocol. <clears throat> pub, sub, everyone gets, query not always. No. That's the tricky part. How are query different? Why query are special? Oh, the <clears throat> so the idea with the pub sub, uh, as you can see on the slide, is that you will be able to access data in motion. But then what happens if you want to access, uh, for instance, publications that were made before you joined the network? So how do you access these data at rest? And then there is another challenge that the queries help address is not only do you want to access maybe previously published data. Or data stored in a file system, in a database, whatever, right? Yeah, that at rest. Maybe you want <coughs> to add some value to these data and maybe you want to compute because you're not only interested in the historical data, but maybe a subpart or maybe the average. And so the query answer these, uh, mainly these two questions, which is how to get historical data and maybe how to get more than just the historical data. Yeah, and, and again, might not just be historic. Yeah, I mean, data that is stored is somewhat historical data, <clears throat> but could be some form of just data address that it's sitting in a database um, and we need to retrieve, right? And it's very different. And what is interesting is that with the same abstraction, we are able to um, retrieve data from essentially geodistributed queryable or trigger computation, because in the end, you know, whether the data is obtained by querying a database or by or... triggering a computation doesn't really matter for us. Okay. And then the interesting things about Zeno is that uh, this, you know, the ability of having PubSub and uh, queryable and the ability of issuing query makes us in a way complete with respect to the primitives that you need to build distributed systems. Um, because this is, if you, if you think about it, uh, you need to deal with data in motion, you need to deal with that at rest, and you need to deal with distributed computation. And uh, with, you know, by composing these three primitives, as we have shown, for instance, in uh, the virus getting started with Zeno uh, webinar, uh, you get to cover all of those use cases. Now, the other interesting part of Zeno is that when we designed the protocol, you know, we were really addressing next generation systems. And something that was quite evident for us was that in application domain like robotics, automotive, and in general, edge computing, you had a proliferation of networking technology. And very often, you needed to bridge between different physical networks. Okay. We were mentioning before uh, ThreadX, but Serial is another example, right? Um, very often in robots, you have microcontrollers and the general purpose processor that actually have a serial connection. How do you talk over that serial connections? Uh, for instance, in the uh, if, for those of you that are familiar with the um, uh, Turtlebot 2, they had a custom protocol going over serials. <clears throat> and what we did, I believe you'll discuss, I mean, there is a blog talking about this. Yes. The first things we did is replacing that custom transport with them, yeah. right, yeah. being yeah. able to run over serial. So there was a realization that, first of all, we were able to support multiple different kind of networking technologies. At the same time, be able to run as low as a data link um, and upward, right? Um, then obviously uh, we were very concerned about safety, security, and security is very closely tied to memory management. So it seems, so it seems. Not so, so <coughs> I think where Angelo is trying to get is that we are to build the technology in Zeno, we're using the Rust programming language. So this is what is powering the core of the technology, which offers safety and concurrency uh, guarantees. 
So, and the memory safety, I mean, 70, there are reports, I mean, that are yeah, Microsoft, well known. Yeah, yes. Microsoft did a study <clears throat> that 70% of the CVEs that they are they analyzed were out of all the CVEs they analyzed, 70% were due to memory uh, problems. So, and recently, even the NSA was actually asking, or and there was almost a call to arms to move toward uh, memory safe programming languages yeah. because. So using a memory safe programming language already zaps away 70% of, of the security bugs. So then only leaves logical bugs. <clears throat> exactly, but that's, yeah. Okay, so something else that uh, it's not always well known about Zero, Zeno is that we have built-in shared memory and zero copy support with some quite interesting upgrade coming up for version 1.0, which will um, be available late June, okay? So stay tuned. And then, you know, it can run from embedded up to the data center, just a few bytes, minimal bar overhead. And once again, that was by design to ensure that we can run on quite constrained links. Okay, let's now dig inside the Zeno architecture. So if we start bottom up, the first building block of Zeno is the transport abstraction. This transport abstraction has really two um, sub abstraction that are used to deal with transport that are unicast versus transport that are multicast. And a transport, either unicast or multicast, can concurrently use multiple links, where a link are used to represent either different kind of networking technologies or multiple instances of a same, um, let's say, uh, networking technology. So let, let me be a little bit more explicit. I could have three TCP IP link. Uh, and why does that make sense? It makes sense that me and Julian communicate over three TCP IP link. Why? Because in that, that way, we can uh, better recover, especially if we are across the internet, um, the, um, the TCP IP uh, flow control. Okay. Why? Because what happens is that all of a sudden, as though links in the case of TCP IP um, are actually socket connection, it is as virtually our windows, right? If we're able to communicate on top of logically three TCP IP uh, sockets widens. And so that facilitate uh, the um, dealing with the, uh, with the congestion control of TCP IP that can be quite problematic over the internet. But otherwise you could mix, you know, TCP IP with quick, with serial, with whatever. And in fact, it is the link that you um, can extend, the link abstraction that you can extend to add support to you to an, a different network. So you wanted to add support for LoRa, for instance, you would implement right a LoRa link, yeah. and that's quite straightforward because it's a very simple trait. I think we're having internally like uh, one day to implement a new transport. Yeah. If there is enough support for libraries, yeah, it's only one day. I mean, we can go through the code maybe later, but. Uh, Oh, yeah, we will probably go through it. I'll show, we'll show it because it's honestly trivial. And that's one of the benefits, right? Because you have an entire framework that with, with a very small effort, which is you not know, just implement a tiny trait, right? To deal with either with a unicast or a multicast link uh, for whichever network you're you are caring about and you're in business. Okay, then obviously something else that is quite important because if you're trying to integrate systems you don't want to be constrained topologically so it's good to remind that in Zeno we don't have any topological constraint right in Zeno you can do peer-to-peer -peer over a click peer-to-peer -peer over a mesh you can route communication you can have client client communication can be mediated by routers but also by peer so creativity is the limit in a way other important aspect router you know psychologically you always think about a big cisco lamp of hardware and software right no, it doesn't have to be yeah exactly so that's a soft router it's very lightweight and you can run it easily on a raspberry pi that's in fact what we do and when okay. if you have seen any of our demo with uh, with the robots which has a uh, let's say computing board that they have a raspberry pi yep. uh, that's there is a router running always inside it but we'll get back to it and there is more than enough resources to make it uh, plenty yeah. yeah yeah absolutely okay other aspect that will be essential in addressing this um uh, world, world garden. garden problem again is the ability that zeno provides 
to integrate third party technologies, one of which could be protocols, right? So we already have plugin for MQTT, for DDS, for WebSockets, um, and obviously some optimized uh, connectors for ROS2. Uh, why some optimized connector for ROS2? Because in the end, ROS2 runs over DDS. Yeah. So what's the difference? Uh, what's the difference between Zeno and DDS? Well, <laughs> no, 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 no. The ROS2, because we have standard support for you. Know, you could you could bridge yeah, ROS2 so... communication using the DDS plugin. Yeah. That's what many companies have done for a very long time. But then we implemented the ROS2 specific plugin because we can leverage some of the advantage some of the specific ROS2 and for instance map actions, actions and services, services to carry over. exactly yeah. so that uh, further uh, reduces the discovery information improves the performance and um, uh, you um, actually you weren't at roscon last year no no uh, <laughs> but, Julian. correct but we were so the other julian was demonstrating for instance how quickly, right, we could start our reads over a Wi-Fi. Yeah. And most of the improvement were a consequence, even for very complex robots, to the uh, to the ROS2 plugin that we that we did. I think one of the demonstrations during the last ROSCON that most impressed people was the ability while using the Wi-Fi at the conference mm -hmm. to be able to teleoperate a robot yeah, also. going through the servers. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And this is thanks to that dedicated <clears throat> ROS2 DDS. Okay. And so I think in this slide, there are two things we have to keep in mind. One, which is suppose that you have a robot that talks a bespoke protocol, mm -hmm. right? You can implement a, a plugin for our Zeno router. And even in that case, there is just a trade to implement. It's a little bit more than a day of work, but yes. it's not a month. Okay. Let's put it this way depends maybe on your expertise with Rust, but uh, even for yeah junior developer, I think a week could be enough. Yeah. And then we have Xenoflow, mm. right? So we have um, done a couple of uh, webinar on Xenoflow. So if you have missed some of those, I highly recommend that you go and actually do a deep dive on Xenoflow because today we'll be showing, among other things, how we can leverage Xenoflow to actually deal with some of the, you know, tearing down of certain walls, which we'll see, we'll see in a moment. Okay, so how do we get across the wall? I mean, I love this comic. This is the comic that we had for uh, this month's newsletter. Uh, so by the way, if you are not subscribed to our newsletter, do so because there is plenty of usable information. And as you know, every month uh, we have a, a Zeno comic, which I mean, tend to be quite loved for sure. I, I, I yeah, usually yeah, love them. They are quite fun and nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how can you resolve the network wall? Well, if you have two or more um, Zeno robots, right, that are, well, robots, right, um, that are equipped with different networks, suppose they are using Zeno in this specific case, okay, then uh, it's very easy to integrate them because it's sufficient to have a router sitting somewhere or even a peer, right? So I have a router in this, in this, um, uh, in this picture, but if we go back for a moment to the topology, the reality is that this bridging could be done by a peer. Yes. Which is quite amazing, right? Yeah. So you don't even need to deploy infrastructure. So a router is just, maybe to explain a bit more, a router yeah. is just a different mode in which you would run your Zeno application. So there is the client that delegates most of the routing logic to the peer or router they're connected to, and then peer and router can use the, can have the code in order to do that uh, routing logic. Yeah. So I think the so if we you open a good a good point. So let's open a small parenthesis. Let's get back for a moment. So client is rather clear, right? Because a client is constrained uh, to having a subordinate role in a in a Zeno network, and that's done intentionally because it is assumed that the client is very, very constrained, right? Uh, in resources, perhaps in battery. So it doesn't want to be bothered with, um, you know, dealing with routing data on behalf of other Zen application. Yeah. And so egoistically it says, you know what, please you deal <laughs> with deal getting with my them. data to the interested and vice versa, okay? Yeah. So it's like a parasite of a Zeno network. <laughs> <laughs> it's taking advantage of the benefits you know, of yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so that's one one comic way of dissecting it. So it will stick in people's mind, right? Then you have the peers and the router. And one big difference 
because you know it's it's kind of blurry because you can say yeah the peer has user code and the router doesn't well yes and no because in the router you have plugin and as soon as you have plugin like Zenoflow, all of a sudden you have user logic, right? Yep. So it's kind of a blurry division. And the division that I prefer is infrastructural. So routers are infrastructural node. Usually routers are there most of the time, okay? So when you design your system, depending on how your system is, you decide no, as when you provision a complex network, where you place your routers, and those are part of your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Then peers can come and go, usually they are mobile, right? Um, or they might be mobile, but routers are really infrastructural element of your system. So even administration of routers will be only, you know, potentially something that the owner of the infrastructure will be able to do, or the sysadmin, uh, versus the administration of a peer. Um, and again, we are not discussing Zen administration, but for those of you that are familiar with it, that would make sense. Those that aren't, once again, look at some of the previous previous uh, webinar. I have one in particular about the platform. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so getting back to this slide, right? So that router could be a peer. And as far as this entity is able to talk BLE and Wi-Fi, it will be able right, to, to do the you. network bridging yeah. between the two robots. Nice, right? Um, and again, if they were using some other weird network, uh, proprietary network or whatever, right? You just write a, a general um, a transport link yeah. Yeah. and you are in business. And here you see some example. So let, I'll, uh, I'll let you go yeah. through this. So um, only words is not enough. So the purpose is to show that uh, we've been bridging different uh, communication technology yeah. for a while. So as you can see here, we are uh, controlling, I think it's a turtle bot three. Two. Two? A turtle bot oh, two. No, no, two yeah. or three, yeah, whatever that three. is, yes. Uh, so we're controlling it with <clears throat> a, a motherboard, I think it's uh, ESP32. 32. 32. Yeah. In the uh, box. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the box. So using the gyroscope in order to make it move. And so in order to be able to do <clears throat> this, uh, we first uh, implemented, uh, we use the serial transport yeah. in order to control it. And then we managed to make it work through Bluetooth. And so this is what you can see on the small videos. Yeah. So there is the first wall that we managed to tear down, which is how to control a robot using either serial or Bluetooth. From... And actually even Wi-Fi, because then we added the dong a Wi-Fi dongle. Dong this I think yeah. what we have demonstrated also in some of, of the webinar. Yeah. So first network wall, we can break it. Yeah. Protocol wall. So if you have, let's say, robots that are using different protocols, as we were mentioning before, one robot might be using DDS, another MQTT, another Xeno, then one approach, you just put a Xeno router with the proper plugin in the network and you are in business. But is this the, way, the ideal way to do it? It depends, right? Why? Because, I mean, we have seen the kind of challenges that perhaps DDS creates um, over a Wi-Fi. Yes. And especially if you have quite a few robots, discovery data can be quite harmful for your Wi-Fi. Overwhelming so, even. Yeah. yeah. So can we solve this problem? Well, as we mentioned before, yes, uh, the, the router is very lightweight. So you know, even well, in the robot that we'll demonstrate in a moment, usually what we do is that we deploy a router with a, or you know, a, a bridge, but a router with a proper connector in the robot. That's still very lightweight. And this way you go out, especially when communicating over Wi-Fi with Zeno and get all the advantages of Zeno. So yeah, go ahead. No, maybe to, to explain a bit more. So if here we're talking about uh, ROS2, so that is using for now DDS as the <coughs> communication middleware. The idea is to limit the DDS communication, meaning you keep your robot as is. You just make all the communications local inside the robot and you let the Zeno bridge do all the communication with the outside world. Yeah. And again, but imagine, right, even in this case, and then we will have some slide going on. Suppose that the robot that was talking, suppose we are they are all using ROS2, mm. okay? So the robot that was using MQTT might be using the MQTT, let's say, ROS2 bridge to communicate, yeah, or could be WebSocket, right? So that might be remote, remote, um, but still, 
um, this deployment could make sense, right? If you don't have access to the robot, but you have, if you have the ability right. of deploying a router on the robot, usually this is then the most efficient way of integrating them, right? And the most efficient way of using your network overall. Yeah, you will use less resources. Yeah. You won't have the overwhelming discovery traffic that DDS generates, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And again, uh, you in, you do the integration inside the robot, and out, outside is all Xeno. And still, if it's not possible, then you could imagine that this router is sitting, you no, know, maybe on a warehouse or wherever. We have no topological sure. uh, constraints, as we as we but mentioned before. As Xeno can go from microcontroller up to data center, maybe you can put it somewhere inside the edge device that's for instance, your warehouse. Yeah. yeah. In order to limit further. Yeah. Correct. So, you know, from the robot up to the data center, you know, pick your choice, but anything in between also works. Yeah. And uh, so. So right now, so this slide is uh, a list of the bridges for which uh, Zeno, there is a Zeno plugin. So uh, if you can download the slides uh, on all of them, you would find link where for the proper, proper resources. So we developed an MQTT bridge. This is what we're showing here inside the, the, the image. We, as we mentioned, we also have a DDS bridge. So if you have a DDS system and you don't have ROS2 inside, then we can bridge uh, DDS communication. And then we have dedicated bridges for uh, ROS1 and ROS2. Uh, again, uh, more bridges can be added because Zeno is uh, extensible. And so, that's the plugin we were mentioning before, yeah. just to visualize this one slide, right? So there are plugins that you can have in routers. And by the way, with the version 0.11, you can activate plugin also in applications. Yeah, also, uh, yeah. So that's a feature that we have been requested several times and eventually made it available. Okay, so let's carry on. Now we have solved the problem with the network. We have solved the problem with the protocol. No, no. Yeah, but we are we are representing data differently, right? Yeah. So how do we solve this problem? How do we because, speak the same language? Exactly, right? Because different robots might be coming from different data vendor, and they might represent, um, you know, the velocity differently, hmm. right? Because I could uh, assume that my robots uh, only moves in um, in two D, right? Yes. And so I might give you um, either um, angular velocity um, and uh, radial velocity, or I could give you acceleration in the X and Y. I mean, there are di several different ways of representing velocity. Um, all are good. Or all good, right? That's the main point, Be yeah. Because again, in ROS, the velocity is represented in 3D, because I might have um, uh, also aerial drone. Mm. But suppose I'm someone that only does um, AGV, um, they only move in to do, they don't fly, I don't need the Z, so I wouldn't be representing it. All of a so, sudden, I need to interoperate with the ROS robot. How do I do? So what do we do in that case? Well, I think uh, the solution, as we will show later on, yeah, it's quite uh, straightforward. Use Xenoflow. <laughs> to do a conversion. To do a conversion. The idea would be, indeed, so Xenoflow can subscribe to the topics through Xeno that you're publishing with your robots and then perform some computation and why not republish it with the proper format such that another robot can ingest it. And all of a sudden, you are able to talk the same language. Indeed. So what is Xenoflow? Exactly. So as we, again, Angelo mentioned it earlier, we did an introduction and maybe another <coughs> webinar on Xenoflow. So if you want to have more details, please take a look. So Xenoflow, we want it to be Xeno's declarative data flow programming framework. Again, we want it to go from cloud to things application. And the purpose is to offer a unified abstraction, uh, automated and location transparent deployment as well. So I think this is one key aspect of Xeno, maybe we didn't, we didn't mention mm -hmm. briefly, but really the ability to not be tied down to an address, yeah. but really to the name of a resource. So if at some point you need to migrate your logic on some other computer or the device or the cloud provider, as long as your resource stays the same, you're in business. As, uh, as for Xeno, we are building it in Rust. So for the same guarantees that the, the language offers, uh, we want it to be performant, which is another key point of Xeno, and to optimize communications. Because Xeno for relies on Xeno, communication is the heart of our business. So that's Xenoflow. 
Oh, next. Yeah. So how do we bridge the data model? Wall? So in that slide on the right, uh, you can see uh, a data <coughs> flow descriptor. So this is the declarative part of Zenoflow, where you're really expressing which data uh, you, how your nodes are connected, which data they send and receive. And so in here, we're showing what we deployed for the webinar where we controlled the robot. And what we did with this is that if the robot was too close to an obstacle, we turned the light red. And if it was far away, nothing was detected. It was exactly. Red. So how we did that, what we did is that you can see a uh, line uh, from six to nine, we have the sources and we have one source that is actually uh, subscribing to the bot one scan. So to the LIDAR data that the robot was producing. And then we can see at line uh, 22 that actually once we're done processing, once we're done with the transcoding, uh, we can send it to a ZigBee to MQTT bridge that would actually then control the light. So yeah. data model. And, and by the way, so here in that webinar, we were showing an example of implementing essentially analytics, right? Yeah. With, with Zenoflow. And in fact, intelligence, network intelligence element uh, in Zenoflow. And uh, the nice thing is that um, data model conversion Right. It's 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 just potentially one operator. So it's a very example, a simple example of data flow. Yes. Um, it's it's a very effective use case for for Zenoflow, uh, but there are many other because all of a sudden, once you have um, runtimes for Zenoflow running your infrastructure, right, you can describe any kind of computation conversion being one of those using a data flow programming framework, and deploy them very easily as we have shown on the on the webinar, on the webinar through yeah. Zenoflow, which is quite powerful. Yeah, where not only can we do transcoding, we can do much more. But I mean it's an example of a computation yeah. transcoding, right? It is a simple example, but it is an efficient example. Uh, super required. important because yeah. it breaks the wall, right? This is what we need. One this, brick at a time. This is what we're here for. Yeah. Yeah. So I think yeah. So I think uh, what we want to show with that slide is maybe a summary of everything we've explained until now. So in here, we are showing the deployment that we used when we controlled the light bulb that was detecting the proximity, the proximity of, the, of the robot. And so we can hear, you can see here that we have uh, on the bottom left, we have a ROS2 uh, robot that is communicating DDS. It's communicating both with the cloud uh, that you can see on the bottom right. And it's also communicating with the Raspberry Pi on which we had a MQTT uh, bridge running. So a Zeno MQTT bridge running, but also an MQTT to Zigbee uh, transcoding bridge uh, that would allow then to talk Zigbee with the light bulb. Yeah. So here we can see we have already how many, one, two, three, four different uh, protocols that we're using. And by putting Zeno in the mix, we're able to bridge them all together. Zeno and Zenoflow, right? Now, yeah, we have also the Zenoflow where we wanted to offload part of the computation exactly. to convert that scan data. Maybe it means more than just uh, numbers, but really, okay, maybe there is an action that needs to be taken. And through Zenoflow, we're able to give this information. Yeah. Now, what we briefly mentioned with the extensions, if you closely paid attention to the plugins we have. We also have a HTML5 uh, well, a REST plugin yeah. uh, that we use to control the robot from directly a web browser. And what I think is very nice is that this web browser, we make it run on the cloud. And so anyone that uh, is watching the stream could control as well the robot. Yeah, indeed. We are also so part of the language bindings. Uh, we also have an Android application that we're using to control uh, the robot. And so basically different languages, different protocols, uh, running on different types of hardware. Different networks. Different yeah. networks. So basically all together. Exactly. So now. That's a common case, right? Because yes. there are lots of people you're still using ROS1, transitioning ROS2. And then the question is, I mean, we will have ROS1, ROS2 robots. Wow. Uh, I, and that, that yeah. creates a wall in the middle, right? How do we break this wall? So our idea with this section is to kind of uh, take you on a <coughs> thought experiment. So how would you go to do ROS1, ROS2 uh, bridging? So. As uh, roboticists know, so ROS1 and ROS2 are not compatible. 
they are using different communication middleware. So ROS1 is using its uh, own uh, home cooked uh, TCP pub ROS. Yeah. That's what it's called. Yeah. Uh, so PubSub, whereas uh, ROS2 decided to go with uh, the robot decided to turn off. The robot decided to turn off. Or maybe okay. it's our colleague playing a joke song. Yeah, let, let me go and check <laughs> while you continue because otherwise there won't be any demo. Yeah. So the compatibility problem is that uh, because they're using uh, different middleware, so they cannot communicate. So how would you go and making so that uh, your ROS1 robot could talk with your ROS2 robot? So the first thing you would do is use Zeno as a backbone. So there is hope because we're already providing bridges, one for ROS1, one for ROS2. So you have first step, put Zeno in the mix, and all of a sudden your Zeno routers can communicate. And so basically you would be able to maybe uh, forward your topics. So first part though, but does it really work? The problem now is that even though we are now compatible at the protocol level, at the data model level, we're not compatible. So the serialization format of ROS1 is uh, some, some something specific to ROS1. So in the slides, you have the specification uh, from the ROS documentation. And ROS2, on the other hand, uh, is using DDS. And so DDS for serialization is using uh, CDR. So again, you have a link uh, to the official documentation. So how would you go and uh, given everything we've said before, how would you go and solve that uh, wire incompatibility? Well, hope the answer you guessed it is that you would put Xenoflow in the mix. And so the idea would have to have a Xenoflow transcoder. So you would be able to you would be able to subscribe to your topics published by ROS1. So this thanks to the Zeno router. And then in your Zenoflow application, you would subscribe to this. Then you would perform the conversion. So for instance, uh, deserializing using uh, with the knowledge you have of the ROS1 serialization and then and serializing them again in ROS2 such that your ROS2 robot can yeah. do. And so this would be effectively a recreation of the ROS1, ROS2 bridge. Uh, if we go a little bit in more details, because this is quite easy, you would have to come up with the Python script that just does the, for instance, if you want the ease of, uh, ease of life, you would use a Python script, but that Python script, it doesn't have to be some kind of blind uh, transformation. Maybe you want to as well go deeper into the data and maybe there are some packets that you don't want to forward for many different for instance, reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And so having that Zenoflow <clears throat> bridge would allow you to even bring a bit more logic into uh, and not just do some blind transcoding. And you could do smoothing. There are lots of things you could yeah. do, right? Yeah. This opens many doors. And yeah. so with, uh, for instance, tools that are readily available, the Rust one, uh, the Rust 2 Rust run bridge, uh, this is something that is not possible. You have to have exactly the same topics. So there are some limitations that we can uh, alleviate. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of interesting things. You could you could do multi-sensor data fusion there, right? Yeah, definitely. Because all of a sudden, uh, that could be the part that does the fencing, for instance, mm. right? Yeah. And doesn't uh, let the robot stop, right, in spite of what the operator tries to do. So lots yeah. of very interesting applications that could be done. So maybe to tease people into looking more into Xenoflow, so there are some configuration that you can provide to your Xenoflow nodes. And so that configuration would make it so that you can change without modifying and thus without no, There is something strange going on with the robot because it's all red and it's not charging up. Let me call the other thing now. So we have the famous demonstration effect. Uh, so yeah, your configuration that you can do uh, in on your Xenoflow node, such that you, you can, for instance, uh, if you want to do geofencing, you can decide to change the location at which you, you want your robot, your virtual fence to be. And that will be quite easily done with Xenoflow. So after saying all of that, and just before, so the purpose is to show a little bit of a demonstration. So the demonstration, our purpose is to put into light how we can do the transcoding. So the idea is, as Angelo mentioned earlier, if you are 
controlling your robot and you're only controlling it in 2D. You don't need to go, for instance, uh, above and below. You uh, don't need to send all the linear and angular velocity. So for instance, <coughs> uh, a single float would be enough. So what we did for that demonstration is the idea is to, as the slide explains, just drive. So let's assume that we have some Acme robot that is, uh, as I mentioned, only interested in going in 2D. So for that, the only information we need to send is the linear speed and angular speed. Now let's assume on the other side, you have ROS2 robot. So something that uh, roboticists might be more familiar with. Mm -hmm. And so here, uh, if you want to send uh, some angular, some twist to the robot, you need to, uh, to send both uh, the vector, a 3D vector for linear and angular velocity. Anything to add on this? Uh... No, that's it, right? And uh, you see here that in one case, uh, as we were mentioning before, uh, the assumption was that uh, the robot was moving only and always in 2D. Yeah. And uh, for some reason, right, they were using two different uh, resources or topic for the linear speed and the angular speed. And uh, in the case of, uh, of ROS2, you have a more general data model, which you're representing movement or speed in general in 3D, in a 3D vector, and then the twist command that is often used for teleoperation. But there is a problem with the battery charging, because you see, right. So, Sorry. well, hopefully, we'll, because it's red, and it's not charging properly. So, hopefully, I don't know why. So, let's hurry it's, up because it's running out of battery. <laughs> okay. This is the demo curse. <laughs> so, um, so, what we did, and so, yeah, just wanted to add that it could make totally sense to only send one float over the network if you're constrained in terms of bandwidth or if you're yeah, paying I mean, for Yeah, you could even encode the two in a single... Uh... In a single payload, yeah. Exactly. So for the sake of demonstration, what we did is that we separated them in both. And we are having, so you can see uh, in yellows, so these are the two resources that are published. And in blue, that would be the Xenoflow uh, transcoder. Exactly. That would take these and transform them into a twist. Well, transform the data representation meaning in terms of information, so a vector 3D, right, yeah. as you see there, and then serialize it. Yes. Because they need so, to be serialized in CDR. Yeah. So there are, you know, two transformations that are done, from plain integer to vector, and right? And to CDR. Exactly, so that on the other side, Ross can receive it. So shall we play with this? Shall we play with this? Well, let's, the let's do this. Robot so, still has battery. Yeah, so. and again, let me... Let me show our funny robot. So can you see it? Yeah. We can... Yeah, with the red blinking red light. And again, it's still it's not charging again. So as you show, as you start, share your screen. So start sharing screen. Screen. So, so you're sharing your screen, all right? I am indeed sharing my screen. Okay, great. So what you can see here is that we've launched a uh, standard a Xenoflow uh, daemon. So that is uh, taking care of, this is where you would put your logic for the transcoding. And we can see here that it uh, successfully uh, loaded, uh, started this instance, which I'm going to show you in a bit. So the comment that was done was that we created a Xenoflow uh, instance with mm -hmm. the called Teleo Transcoder. And for, hop. so this is the data flow that is actually being uh, launched. So what we can see here is where we have a source with two uh, Xeno subscribers, yeah. one for linear and one for angular, as we just explained in the demonstration. Exactly. Here we have our operator, the transcoder, that is actually taking these two inputs and producing the CMD VEL, which is the traditional topic name for robots. And finally, having, uh, so in Xenoflow, you need to have inputs and out, uh, a source and a sync. And so we're just having our operator outputting this to our sync, which is a built-in Xeno publisher. So basically everything you send it to that input, it will be published to that topic. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of code, so this is the transcoder. We can see 
here that in the iteration. So what we're doing is that we're getting the linear and angular velocity. So this is some uh, asynchronous uh, Python code. So to go into slightly more detail, the idea is that we are having here our linear input. We're receiving data. And then what we do is that we take the payload directly, convert it to a float, because we know from the construction that actually what is sent on the network can be directly uh, cast into a float. Cast as a float, yeah. yeah. And then what we do is that we create our twist that we serialize using CDR. Same for the angular velocity. And so now what the async IO code is doing is that we're telling it to, if it receives any of the two data, take the first that uh, completes, and this is uh, what is done. And then exactly. yeah. Zenoflow calls in the loop this function in order to, to, well, to drive the robot. Yeah. So maybe you can show us with the editor, the custom teleop to show what it does, yeah. which is pretty trivial, right? So the custom teleop is scroll, uh, scroll down. Yeah, so essentially pretty, pretty straightforward. So if we remove oh, this, so uh, depending on what the user is uh, Which inputting key? in his yeah. keyboard, exactly, we're sending. Uh, so up and down, we would send linear velocity, and uh, left and right, we will send uh, angular velocity. Yeah, and again, some of you will be surprised that in Zeno you can put just a float, but indeed that Zeno supports a certain number of primitive types, yeah. which you can just put uh, as such in uh, most of the supported language bindings with the exclusion of C, okay? And for C, then there are some yeah. facility to, to see that we provide off the shelf to serialize primitive types. So let, let's let's try to have it run because it's, yeah. So you want me to take the camera? Have you already deployed the, so the flow is running? The flow was running. Uh, I didn't touch anything. Okay, so, so let me start the script here. Demo effect is... No, the robot is uh, so is having some serious issues. Let me try. Um, so just to be sure, I'm killing it. No, but I think it's, it's the robot because uh, well, I don't know will, what's going on with it. This will allow us to show uh, to users how actually we would launch the solar Xenoflow. So we're, we're loading this demo for daemon, and then we're giving the configuration. In that configuration, I specify where the user can load the Python extension, mm -hmm. because by default, Xenoflow uh, supports uh, Rust nodes. And so uh, once I have this, uh, now I can use the Xenoflow command line tool in order to query the different runtimes that are running. We can see here that we have our Python uh, proof of concept uh, daemon. And so now we can uh, ask it to up, uh, instance create the transcoder. That way it shows everything. So internally, what we do is that we ask the flow to uh, load that uh, flow. It will return, uh, if successful, well, it will return a unique identifier, which allow us to then query the runtime to see if there is everything is working as intended. No, but it's it's the robot that is. Not. So if you ping bot one dot local, it's the robot that is just not working. I think it's hung completely. I don't know what's going on with it. So. No, I remember. Oh, to... you... oh, can you can ping it? I can ping it, yes. Oh, OK. Yeah. So let's see. So we have restarted our instance. So now if what? Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. So good. So what you can show here, that. Yeah. I don't know if I'm showing the robot. So what we can see here is Hold that- on, let me check the video. Yeah, you're showing the robot. What we can see here is that uh, basically Angelo- Let me show, yeah, I can its, actually, what I will do, I will share my screen now. With its, uh, Angelo actually is running on his machine. Uh, so Yeah, the so let me restart it here. Yeah. So this is the common command I'm running. And if you look at the custom teleop is the one that is putting, as Julian was mentioning before, the, the raw data. And so that data is basically two floats, that, uh, yeah. well, one float, depending on if it's uh, angular or linear, that is being sent. And then Zenoflow is doing the transcoding. 
because that's a roster robot so you know you shouldn't you shouldn't be able to operate it as such but here we go and so and and again you know i can i can operate in real time so there is no latency it's completely smooth and the battery is about to die so let's go back to the docking see that you have very fancy driving okay skills. perfect An italian driving yeah. style of course <laughs> okay put it a little bit turn it around I'll, 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 uh, yeah because you don't see the image okay perfect okay so, so with this uh, small demonstration we wanted which, to show which i think yeah gets the point yeah, right really gets the point so the idea really is to to show that uh, even if you have two uh, robots or two infrastructure or yeah. if you want to send data in a way that is not supported by your robot yeah then having a Zeno router uh, which is already lightweight yeah you can load a Zenoflow uh, either plugin or standalone daemon again they are not heavyweight uh, uh, heavy constrained exactly software to do that conversion and then provide the yeah. git functionality you're yeah. looking for and by the way before we wrap up we had mm -hmm. promised to show how to do links yes so this is the trade the, the, the Zenolink defines the trade that you would have to implement and then if you want to look at um, you know example or some example implementation of links you have for quick for serial links tcpip tls udp pipe uh unix socket streams vsoc so that's quite uh, useful if you're communicating uh, with a virtual machine mm -hmm. or between virtual machine um web okay. socket and you know whatever you want to add i know and for once again, a fact that the let's web open the web socket was i think wrote uh, written in half a day oh yeah so that's even less than that i would guess hmm. yeah i mean there isn't much code okay so that's it Okay, so let's go back to the slides. And um, I mean, final thoughts. So what did we show in this webinar? Well, we showed essentially, if we go back right to this slide, that there are three classes of walls that you need to deal with. Those caused by networks, those caused by protocols, those caused by data model. Mm -hmm. Those caused by networks, Zeno helps you solve with you know its architecture and the fact that it's super simple to support new kind of networks by defining a network link yeah. those caused by protocols have plugins right have plugins we can you can write even plugins if you want to add a new exactly. protocol yeah. and again if you combine this with the flexibility of topological deployment and the fact that now in version 011 you can activate plugins even in applications right it's super powerful and then we have the third kind of wall, which is data model um, differences. And there you have, you know, Zenoflow. And again, I mean, Zenoflow, I find it's a very elegant and structured way of dealing with this because it's not just a programming model. It gives you a very lightweight deployment framework yeah. because you can deploy Rust binaries or Python scripts. We, and even, so we were even looking into C++. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if there are other main bindings that would be quite useful. Wasm will be, you know, this, is, this yeah. is something that I'm and, looking forward to. Yeah, and by the way, so something we should get next is the ability, you know, there is, we were discussing this some times ago. There is now this um, engine for Rust scripting. Yes. So all of a sudden you can execute Rust script so right. you could have operator that actually are written as Rust script. So you don't don't have any uh, platform specific dependency. You are not shipping around um, yes. executable. If the logic is quite simple, then this would be a very elegant and powerful solution. Yeah, exactly. And so then, as you mentioned before, right, you are not forced to use Zenoflow. You could write your own application to do that conversion. Mm -hmm. But then where do you run it? Right. That's a good question. Huh? You need to deal, yeah. and with Zenoflow, it's nice because it gives you also the ability of provisioning, as, as you demonstrated quickly in this webinar and in previous. Okay, so I suggest we take a few questions now. So yeah. can you can you show questions from your laptop? Actually, I cannot wait to turn it around.
Okay, so there is one question concerning the ROS1 uh, um, plugin, uh, if it's available. It is available. It is available under Eclipse um, Zeno. Yeah. And um, um, let's say that is not as mature as the ROS2 plugin. The ROS2 plugin is very mature. But again, you are welcome to use it and provide us, provide us feedback. ROS2 plugin is super mature. Yes. Uh, deployed in several commercial um, um, environment. Um, ROS1, I don't think, has had the same mileage, uh, which also kind of you know makes sense uh, because the main reason why today people are using the ROS2 plugin is not so much to solve the walled garden problem, but it's to solve you know the problem you mentioned before of discovery, but that's completely different. Yeah, the DS related issue. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there is another question concerning the WebSocket um, bridge for ROS2 and whether that's compatible with the WebSocket transport for Zen. No. So if you wanted to use that, you would have to implement a Zeno plugin uh, that understands actually how um, ROS messages are sent over WebSockets. Because what is the difference? If we go back to this slide here, at the link level, we are talking the Zeno protocol. Okay, so as you see, whenever you implement a link, um, you see blobs. Okay, you don't need to, you don't need to understand when implementing a link the Zeno protocol. You send and receive blobs, but those blobs represent Zeno messages. The WebSocket plugin for ROS2 is actually sending ROS2 messages, and so in that case, you couldn't leverage the a WebSocket plugin for Zeno, you would have to do a plugin at the uh, router level, okay? Uh, and that would be also quite straightforward, actually. Yeah. You basically need to encapsulate the Rust message. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I guess that's pretty much it. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, next okay. webinar will be looking into the Zeta platform and how you can use that to do robot to anything communication. Um, and it uh, will be hosted by for a change by Gabriel and Steven. Yeah. Okay. Another so, exciting demonstration. Yeah. Up. Sounds good. Take care, everyone. And thank, thank you, everyone. Always thank you, a pleasure. Andrew. Bye. Same. Bye.